Ancient Greek armor in the Philippines? Tropical heat and humidity would have probably made our ancestors partial to light or no armor, which was a fair exchange for speed and mobility in ambushes and naval battles. In the U.S. National Museum, we find Philippine ancestral armor made of carabao horns, skins, and fibers. Some record that Lapu-Lapu was wearing mail and plate armor when he battled with Magellan, possibly similar to this carabao horn plate armor with metal links known to have been used in Mindanao. Most people suppose that our ancestors' armors were copied from European styles because of similarities, but if Lapu-Lapu was already wearing armor when Magellan came ashore, then how early were these European influences? In 2018, locals in Mindanao were surprised to find armor of a type they had never seen before, complete with helmets and weapons. Soon sold in the Philippine antiquities market, we were fortunate enough to track down two sets of these armors, which may give us important insight into our ancient past. Each set of armor was composed of a muscle cuirass, a helmet, and a battle axe. The muscle cuirass, also known as the heroic cuirass, first appeared during the archaic period and was distinctly Greek in style. The introduction of toned armor seems uniquely Greek, and the reason is more aesthetic than functional. There was no structural reinforcement that came from having six-pack outlines or little stylized nipples. Bronze armor was worn by the wealthy elite who could afford this prestigious musculature. Senior officers who may have appeared godlike with burnished bronze physique. Muscle cuirass is often shown in Greek and Roman art, worn by generals, emperors, and gods. The muscle cuirass was cast from sheet bronze in two pieces, then hammered into shape. Both muscle cuirasses found in Mindanao may have come from an early state of its evolution, before incorporation of metal hinges. Riveted holes along the edges reveal where strips of leather may have been laced to hold the armor snugly. Decorative bronze bosses may have been cast separately before attaching to the cuirass. Low-relief imagery in bronze are symmetrically laid out on the left and right sides of the breast, rib, and abdomen areas. Aside from the display of Greek heroic nudity, the motif of these decorative elements identify the owners of these ancient armor. On the breast of Muscle Kiras I is the classical Greek lion head. Lions symbolize the crossing over from the mortal to the heroic realms. Greek art often realistically depicted the mighty king of the jungle, indicating that they may have had the opportunity to observe the animal, unlike Chinese depictions that were likely created from stories of the lion. The rib area is embellished with a celestial wheel, also known as the lightning wheel. They represented the heavens where the celestial gods roamed. Central circle is seen as the axis around which the stars revolve in the heavenly planisphere. The eight points of the triangles show the cardinal directions. The Gorgonion, also known as Medusa's head, was symbolic of the Greek goddess Athena, who embodied war and battle strategy. Both war gods Ares and Mars were often portrayed wearing the muscle cuirass. The Gorgonion is often shown classically with rounded head, extended tongue, fangs, and spirals around her head, representing snakes. Two different images grace the breast of Muscle Kiras too. On the right is the Anemone Flower. The Anemone Flower was the symbol of the Phoenician war goddess Tanit, who has been linked to the planet Venus. Greek myth tells us that the tears of Aphrodite for her lover Adonis mixed with his blood giving rise to the anemone flower. Over the left breast is a battle-ready horse. The horse represented power and mobility to the ancient Phoenicians, who were known for their horsehead hippoi mastheads, often putting horseheads on both ends of the ship in honor of their celestial god, Yam. Greeks understood the importance of the horse in battle, giving the rider additional speed and height advantage. On both sides of the belly, we find Omicron, Ayin, with classical Greek floral and geometric embellishment that pay homage to the heavenly watchers. The eye motif frequently appears in Phoenician art, especially on their core-formed fused glass beads. These two muscle cuirasses must have belonged to persons of importance in the Greek archaic period. Both the symbolism and the amount of man-hours and expense would make it unlikely for ordinary people. Ancient armor was not a trade item, nor was it likely brought by a tourist who carelessly left it behind. 
Why would we have ancient Greek armor in Mindanao? The crested helmet, the archaic Corinthian or Spartan type copper alloy helmet with nose and cheek guards has become a recognizable symbol of the Greek soldier. The two crested helmets found in the Philippines were of similar design to each other. Nose guards were cut in the shape of a three-leafed flame palmet or an early version of the fleur-de-lis, traditional designs used in classical Greece. Incised lines etched on the nose guard echoed the design. Protective cheek guards appear to have been connected to the helmet and reinforced with three raised circular rivets on each side. Yet the most interesting part of the helmet is its crest. That reveals these high-ranking soldiers were not just visitors to these islands. Central top portion of the helmet is decorated with a realistic tokai gecko, known to Filipinos as the tukok, complete with adhesive foot pads, rough textured body, spots, large rounded eyes, and distinctive body and head shape. This type of gecko is indigenous to the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries. The high relief sculpture was done in repose with a gecko form hammered onto the copper alloy sheets from underneath. An examination of the lizard in the imagery of archaic Greek vase painting suggests that it was a figure of power and portent and often an omen of disaster. It is argued that the lizard should be ranked among such uncanny beasts as gorgons, sphinxes, and at least one monumental feline from the archaic Athenian Acropolis. During the first millennium BC, the lizard, or more specifically the gecko, featured prominently in the art of middle proto-Corinthian vase painters, who portrayed it often in the midst of violent context, appearing in bronze and stone relief. The gecko often finds itself in the middle of opposing forces, about to engage in combat, and was seen as an omen of impending disaster during the archaic period. Even today, the gecko remains an important figure in tribal Philippine art. The Battle Axe Many types and shapes of axes, double axes, maces, and hammers from this archaic period have been found on mainland Greece, the Aegean, and Anatolia. Mycenaean Greece placed great importance on the battle axe, used for ritual as well as a tool and weapon. It is believed that the ancient Greek battle axes may have been ceremonially dedicated to the mother goddess. Homer tells us that Mycenae was home to King Agavemnon, leader of the Greeks in the Trojan War. In another epic written during the same age, the Mahabharata of India records the Parashu or battle axe as the weapon of Shiva that was given to Parashurama, Rama with the axe. The legendary Parashu received by Parashurama from the god Shiva was described as having four cutting edges, one on each end of the blade and one on each end of the shaft, a description that fits the battle axe found with armor one, bronze muscle cuirass, and a helmet with a gecko crest in Mindanao, Philippines. These battle axes may have been effective close combat weapons used by the Greek soldiers in East Asian context. Battle Axe 1 shows wear on the blade and spear edges. The parachu was considered the most lethal close combat weapon known in the epics. Iconography and design elements are consistent with classical Greece, like the Gorgonion, which features prominently on the axe blade, representing the goddess of war and master strategist. Phoenician elements include the anemone flower from which the upper spear point and the flailing weapon emerge, known in Greek design as the rosette. Repeating geometric shapes, triangles and circles, along with stylized flowers and curling vines, form patterns recognizable as those used by the ancient Greeks. Four armored elephants displayed prominently on both battle axes indicate that they may have been used or were familiar with battle elephants. For these warriors to reach the Philippine Islands, they may have encountered both China and India, who used Asiatic elephants in battle from a very early age. Phoenicians had a trading colony in Cyprus where they established connections with mainland Greece. Both the Phoenicians and Greeks had settled colonies in Spain, the Phoenician colony of Gadir in the early 1st millennium BC, while the Greeks founded the Iberian colony of Emporion in the 6th century BC. Phoenicians and Greeks were in relatively friendly competition as they exchanged goods, cultures, and beliefs. 
settling foreign lands and building ancient ports to sustain the maritime trade boom from the 8th to 6th century BC, did this frenzy of colonization, in order to facilitate international trade and enrich their motherland, reach all the way to the Philippine archipelago? Could these sets of armor from the same archaic Greek age of expansion fill in the gaps of our missing national memories? In a collection of documents that listed the Greeks as one of those who had settled in these lands, Father Pedro Chirino, Spanish historian, also noted the Greek influences in the Tagalog language. Tagalog shares in four qualities of the four greatest languages in the world, namely Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Spanish. With the Greek, the articles in the declension of nouns and in the conjugations, the abundance of voices and moods. Thank you for joining us in opening the book of our past.